What's up guys, it's Stock Picks by Tim, and I've got Palantir's earnings for you. It's a cut up edited version, it is about an hour long. I'll leave you a link below if you want to listen to the whole thing, because there is a lot more uh, information there if you want to listen to the full version. So I'm going to leave you with my edited version here in a second. But this, as of uh, this upload, is down roughly 20%. Palantir has been just falling off a cliff. I did take it as an opportunity to add and buy a couple more. Revenue was right in line, EPS missed and uh, their outlook was less than Wall Street's estimates, so this has just been dropping. But in reality, I mean, looking at it, we've got a 470 million Q2 outlook, which is more than this, uh, the revenue that we just got this quarter, which is a nice revenue increase quarter over quarter consistently. And also, as for their outlook as well, we've got 30% revenue growth expected year over year over the next three years. And there's also a lot more, such as 2.3 billion in cash and no debt. Now let's roll that video and get right into it. We are a company to thrive in good times and we thrive in bad times. We, we are not built in the way the theologians of our financial institutions would love us to be built so that you're built you know, exactly like if we had listened to them, we would only be growth and no free cash flow. We're a company that throws off free cash flow. We're a company that expected inflation. We are obviously super committed to the mission. We are, we are playing a critical, crucial and much bigger role than we're allowed to mention or would ever discuss in public. In the government context, where we are playing an outsized role, and, uh, and we're very proud of that, and we're proud of the people we're able to support, and, uh, and, um, and we're also um, uh, eager to continue to help to support them. Must also say, the people who are uh, watching this, many of whom share our belief that the future is to be won by people who accept the reality of what it is and not what it ought to be, that you can only change the ought by accepting what is, that you've stuck with us and are, I hope will stick with us, and we are going to continue supplying the world's most important products to the most interesting, creative, and effectual people in the world and continue to thrive as this hybrid company that is both bull and bear and comes into full stride in both environments, but in absolutely anomalous stride when times are rough and people are hiding. Palantir's products are on the absolute front line and you see them in the news every day. And we would love someday to discuss exactly what we're doing, but we are playing a good role in your support and, and buying into the, the world as it is, is enormously important to us. We had gap operating margins of negative 9% versus negative 33% a year ago, reflecting our continued march to gap profitability and we had adjusted operating margins of 26%. We have been building our company and our products for this world. The stability on which so many models that purported to explain the world rely, it's vanished, if it ever existed at all. We have built a company for the world that is, not the world that ought to be. And it is instability, not its absence, that makes our software all the more essential. At our last earnings call, the invasion of Ukraine had not yet occurred. From the moment those tanks rolled into Ukraine, we have been delivering our capabilities to the front. We have been continuously shipping innovation over the course of the conflict to provide Western militaries the software that they need to fulfill their missions. Every product and capability has been employed by our customers from Gaia, Gotham, Edge AI, Foundry, Nexus Peering, and more. And the newest of them, Meta Constellation, continues to deliver value in making space-based collection truly operational, delivering significant mission outcomes. Real-world events are driving enormous and long-term opportunities for growth. We are on the front lines, seeing what needs to exist, hearing from commanders and users, and building now what is needed and what will power the next decade of U.S. and allied defense programs. We did this a decade ago in Afghanistan with Nexus Peering. We did this a year ago with Meta Constellation, whose impact writes headlines in the New York Times. And we will continue building the software of the future, ramping our investment heavily, across the business in the face of these palantir-shaped macro conditions. This focus has delivered tremendous depth in our R&D and our full-stack IP. We now have this opportunity, in addition to releasing new products at pace, to bring an increasing amount of that innovation to market. And that's what you're seeing with Apollo. We believe Apollo will fundamentally change how software is deployed, anticipating a future where multi-tenant SaaS is dead and is clearly dying in the present, a trend that is accelerated by geopolitical events. Every software company will need to be able to deploy their software into their customers' environments, requiring them to manage fleets of heterogeneous environments across public clouds, on-premises, sovereign clouds, and growing data jurisdictional boundaries, and to do all of that seamlessly. 
Apollo will take customers from a world of continuous deployment to autonomous deployment. And we have been pleased with the market reception to Apollo in our Demo Day event, really being received by a completely new buying audience. The greatest opportunity for Foundry continues to be the application development infrastructure platform. We believe that Foundry will become the place that you go to build the applications of the future. With AWS or Azure, with their highly unopinionated collection of services, most of the work remains in front of you to get to value. And all of that onus is on you, the customer, to get to that value. With Foundry, you're 90% of the way there on day one. Software-defined data integration, native multi-tenancy for your applications, the OPIs, version pipelines, applications, artifacts, to just name some of the components that make Foundry work from the start. That's why U.S. Space Force's Kobayashi Maru Software Factory realized their ambition, building 13 operationally accepted applications on top of Foundry in months while sunsetting legacy $100 million-plus programs. That's why Airbus rolled out an internally developed supply chain network control tower, a suite built on top of Foundry's application development infrastructure. And, and this set of applications, it, it mitigates supply chain issues and is working towards saving hundreds of millions of euros annually by speeding up production against existing fixed capacity and reducing inventory across all parts. What AWS was in the last decade, Foundry will be in the next. In April, we closed a renewal with a major U.S. Fortune 100 company for over $150 million. This customer hosted a hackathon with over 600 participants featuring applications built in under four days across finance, build planning, network resiliency, and customer experience. This was a good and telling example of how scaled customers built better on Palantir as application development infrastructure. Last quarter, we saw continued interest in our modular offerings. Hospitals need to improve operational efficiencies surrounding patient flow and staffing processes in order to decrease the length of stay and ensure patients have access to proper care. Palantir's hospital operation suite has proven a unique ability to solve these problems through collaborative decision-making based on real-time data with targeted, event-driven notifications and actionable AI. Palantir's hospital operation suite is now used by hospitals covering over 37,000 beds across the U.S., up from just over 1,000 on January 1st. Our ambition is to be the sixth prime contractor for the U.S. federal government, a trusted partner to deliver complex, end-to-end, -end integrated hardware and software solutions, building on the legacy of programs that we prime today. But we seek to be the first company to do this as a software prime, using software innovation and our unmatched expertise to deliver new integrated hardware software capabilities faster than the pace of conflict. U.S. Space Force continues to deliver new operational capabilities to America's space guardians who have set the gold standard for allies. This is leading to substantial interest in U.S. Space Force's Warp Core platform, which was built on Foundry amongst allied nations. At Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, to an audience of U.S. and allied governments, Peter Marquez, the former head of space policy at the National Security Council and the head of space policy at AWS, presented Project Argus, a new space situational awareness platform built on Foundry. We closed a 10 million pound enterprise expansion with the UK Royal Navy. Palantir software is used by the Royal Navy across a broad spectrum of areas from strategic workforce planning to supply chain management. Our government healthcare business grew with an expansion with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The growth of the work is reflected in the doubling of the run rate. Over the past year, while continuing to deliver on the CDC's Foodborne Pathogen Program, which we have been powering since 2009, the CDC expanded Foundry's pathogen surveillance and response work and deployed generalized modules built on top of a common Foundry ontology against new pathogens, including measles, mumps, legionella, and novel flu. The CDC is also using Foundry to process genetic sequence data derived from wastewater samples. On the other side of the Atlantic, our continued investments in software-defined data integration with our newest pipeline builder product continues to pay off at the NHS where they were able to roll out Foundry to 38 hospitals integrating hundreds of data sets in March alone to enable them to work through the national care backlog. The U.S. government was 42% of our first quarter revenue and has been a leading driver of growth for eight years. With a 30% CAGR from 2013 to 2021, which we view as a long-term trend, first quarter revenue grew 31% year over year ahead of our prior guidance to 446 million. Overall net dollar retention was 124%. Commercial revenue growth accelerated for the fifth consecutive quarter. 
first quarter commercial revenue increased 54% year-over-year to $205 million, up from a 47% increase in the fourth quarter. Commercial growth continues to be driven by our U.S. business, as U.S. commercial revenue growth accelerated to 136% in the first quarter, up from 132% in Q4. Additionally, with the geopolitical landscape outlined by Alex, we expect government bookings activity to increase for the remainder of the year, resulting in stronger government revenue growth in the second half of 2022. We ended the first quarter with $3.5 billion in total remaining deal value, up 26% year-over-year, while duration shortened 4% over the same period. We ended the first quarter with $1.2 billion in remaining performance obligations, up 86% year-over-year. As a reminder, RPO is primarily comprised of our commercial business, as it does not take into account contracts with an initial term of less than 12 months and contractual obligations that fall beyond termination for convenience clauses, both of which are common in our government business. Margins and expenses are on an adjusted basis, which excludes stock-based compensation. Adjusted gross margin was 81%. Contribution margin was 57%. First quarter adjusted income from operations, excluding stock-based compensation and related employer payroll taxes, was $117 million, representing an adjusted operating margin of 26%, ahead of our prior guidance of 23%. First quarter adjusted earnings per share were two cents, which includes a negative two cent impact driven primarily by unrealized losses on marketable securities. We generated 35 million in cash from operations and 30 million in adjusted free cash flow. Cash flows vary quarter to quarter, but it's worth noting the $66 million increase in our accounts receivable balance. At the end of Q1, we had a very strong war chest, 2.3 billion in cash and no debt. Turning to our outlook, we are guiding to a base case of $470 million in revenue for Q2. There's a wide range of potential upside above our guidance, including those driven by our role in responding to developing geopolitical events. We expect second quarter adjusted operating margin of 20% in the base case as we accelerate investments to support our customers' mission in advance of anticipated contract awards and continue to expect full-year adjusted operating margin of 27%. We expect and are already seeing an acceleration of our U.S. government revenue resulting from these investments. Continuing to execute the guidance strategy set forth by our CEO, Alex Karp, in our year-end 2020 earnings call with regard to long-term revenue guidance, we are providing and will continue to provide guidance of 30% or greater revenue growth for this year and the next three years at each earnings call. Now, what are your guys' thoughts on Palantir PLTR? Leave some comments below on what you think, and let's get into the Q&A. When is the company targeting to be gap profitable? We had a negative 9% gap operating margin in Q1, an improvement from negative 14% in Q4, and from negative 33% in Q1 2021. So we're making significant progress. And Q1 was our strongest gap quarter to date. And not to mention, last year, for the full year, we posted $424 million in adjusted free cash flow, with a 31% adjusted operating margin and we're already off to a strong start this year. But with that said, we're preparing for a world that has the highest chance of a nuclear war in my lifetime, let alone since my parents were kids. And as Alex discussed, the quality of our government revenue, as viewed through growth, margin performance, durability, and resilience, is unique to Palantir. We think this uniqueness will be incredibly important in the quarters to come. Look, the base case is, is really establishing how we're thinking about um, the, the visibility that we have. The upside is, is quite large. I mean, a lot of this comes down to t contract timing and the acceleration of events. Uh, there's a fair amount of work that's in flight here. Our, the way that we engage with customers is we're not going to deprive you of help in, in your moments of greatest need when you're at war because paperwork isn't in yet. And so we think the, we, we have visibility into the upside. We're not going to comment on the specifics of it but it, it, it's meaningful, um, but it's also hard to predict. And what we need to be focused on right now is just delivering, not only because of what it implies for this quarter, the next quarter, and this full year, but what it implies for the long-term growth of the business and the relevance we have to solving the most important problems in the world.